Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, one of the barriers that was identified as an issue at the June meeting was institutional barriers, and it was made, uh, the point was made several times in the course of that meeting that uh, it was very important to have strong buy-in from the institution. And so we thought we would actually, uh, it would be valuable for us to hear some perspectives from some institutional leaders for why they thought this was an important effort for them to go uh, forward with. And we're really delighted to have a couple that have made time to come speak with us today. And we'll, we'll start with uh, Bill Evans from St. Jude's. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Rex, and uh, you know I'm happy to be here and, and share with you the uh, the thinking of, of St. Jude. I guess by way of disclosure, I should tell you that um, I've been the director and CEO of St. Jude since 2004, uh, but I've been an NIH-funded um, investigator in the field, uh, like Dan Roden, since the days when pharmacogenomics was called pharmacogenetics, and I still. Uh, am engaged in, in running a lab and, and participating in that sort of research, which is actually the most enjoyable part of my job. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm here as an institutional CEO, and so let me just give you a brief bit of background and then um, sort of tell you where we are and where we're going next. I, I would point out, first of all, we started using genomics to uh, decide therapy at St. Jude in 1984. Um, and that's when <clears throat> we began to realize that somatic changes, major structural changes like chromosomal translocations or chromosome number were prognostic in children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the uh, most common form of cancer in children. And so beginning in 84, we started <clears throat> using first ploidy and subsequently chromosomal translocations to assign patients to different levels of intensity for their ALL treatment, which could include a, a bone marrow transplant if they had some of the high-risk uh, translocations as indicated there, BCR, ABLE, MLL, AF4. And now we're, we're actually looking at mutations in specific genes uh, that can also be targets uh, for therapy. Um, currently that's done more in AML than ALL, but as I'll come to at the end, we're actually beginning to see where we can do that with ALL. <clears throat> also, we began to investigate this is sort of where I got involved. Um, in the 80s, um, inherited germline genome variation uh, that could influence uh, toxicity effects of some of the cancer chemotherapy we're using. And we began in 19, the 1990s, late 90s actually, to use TPMT genotype to decide doses of uh, mecaptopurine. And um, I'm not sure if we have a pointer up here. But, and in, in work that Mary led, we also showed that not only the rare individual with two variant alleles of TPMT, but also uh, heterozygotes at the TPMT locus had a higher risk of drug-related toxicities. And so we began to adjust therapy uh, based on that genetic polymorphism, which we now do routinely. We used to give all kids the same dose. They were quite different in their tolerance. Once we began to adjust doses, some kids are now treated with 10% of the standard dose if they have two variant alleles for TPMT, and they have the same toxicity profile then as the other kids when we do that, and they have the same cure rate. Uh, in fact, perhaps they do even slightly better, but certainly no worse than their wild-type counterparts treated with, in many cases, 10 times the dose of that drug. Uh, and now there are guidelines on, on sort of how this is done. Uh, Mary's been leading this through the CPIC, and I'll come back to that in a minute, in terms of the approach we're currently taking to use this germline genetic polymorphism to individualized therapy. Now, eight years after those discoveries, we began to sort of do that. This, in this issue of, of science, the genome issue, genomic method, medicine <laughs> issue in 2003 was pointing out that eight years later, this still wasn't a uh, routinely used diagnostic in the clinic. And even my friend, uh, Russ Altman, is quoting here, quoted here as saying he thought this would be sort of the the poster child for how to do this, it's so highly penetrant, yet if you read this, this article and one in Nature the same weekend, it says the medical community remains uh, skeptical. And I think in many ways it, they still do. I guess the other thing I should point out in the way of disclosure here that there was a, uh, it noted in there that our institution had 
actually uh, filed and obtained patents for these TPMT SNPs as diagnostics, and that allowed us to license them out to, in a non-exclusive way, to several national reference labs that could offer this as a clinical diagnostic. Uh, a diagnostic was very expensive at the time, something we can now do for pennies in that day, uh, took hundreds of dollars to get the test done under CLIA conditions. But just sort of take that with a grain of salt. That, uh, a little bit of that uh, royalty money came back to support my lab. Um, I would submit, and this is a photo of me talking to a patient and a parent in 1999, and yes, I'm using a piece of film to have a conversation about a genetic test that we had done and that that was going to be used to change uh, the treatment for this particular child in the captopurian. Obviously, technology for genome interrogation and for uh, identifying these associations has changed dramatically, but I would submit that translation continues to lag uh, in terms of taking this to clinic, and that's why I applaud what's happening here at this and sort of sharing with you what we're trying to do to make that happen. So when Mary and I wrote this review, we put this sort of pie in the sky, the future technology would be some arrays, and on that we would not just interrogate TPMT or the somatic changes in leukemia cells and use that to guide therapy, but there would be a, a growing list of genetic polymorphisms and perhaps uh, somatic changes that would drive that um, diagnostic that we would do up front on every new patient with ALL or whatever the disease. So. You know, I think one other reality here, um, before I tell you exactly what we're doing, is that the academic system still continues to reward the discovery side of all this uh, in terms of promotion and tenure committees and, and other kinds of academic currency which travel with faculty, regardless of what institution you're at, but the translation and the recognition by institutions of the importance of translation is something that I think still remains very sort of institutional uh, in nature and uh, hopefully it's going to become more systemic. So what are we trying to do to translate these genomics uh, more so, more deeply into clinical practice at St. Jude? I would say that, you know, one thing is we put it in our strategic plan for the institution. So we had one in 2005, we just did a new one that we had approved last year. And as you can see, in addition to trying to push cure rates to 90% or higher for all childhood cancers, the fourth one on the list there says, we want to be a model center for translating biomedical discoveries into innovative treatment strategies for children with cancer. Um, I think it's important for the institution to sort of be public, at least internally, if not externally, about this is a priority. Uh, and it sort of helps galvanize institutional decisions and thinking and participation of faculty. And then if you read deeper in that strategic plan, we also go forward and say to um, fully realize the promise of individualized medicine because it is so complex um, and not well understood and has to represent the integration of, of information and data from multiple sources that we need to give some support to our clinicians in real time in terms of evidence-based decision support tools that can affect and guide their clinical decisions in real time. So people always say, all right, you're an administrator, how much money do you spend? That really tells me your commitment. And, <laughs> and I would argue that's not true, but I'm not even sure what the number is. However, I would say that <clears throat> of our $625 million annual operating budget, you know, we are predominantly a cancer center, so on the research piece, it's at least half of our budget is invested in some way or another toward um, the discovery side of genomics as it relates to childhood cancer. The patient care side, it's just, you know, how much of the hundreds of millions we spent on our electronic medical record and decision support is because of genomics versus other aspects of individualized medicine is, is sort of hard to quantitate. But it's not a trivial investment, and we're very happy to make that investment, whether it's 160 million or 220 million or, or even more, and that doesn't even count the the high seeks and the other equipment that we're investing in. This is just operating dollars. Um, so here's an example. Now, as I said, we routinely used a somatic genome variation to decide treatment of ALL. That continues to expand. And increasingly, and this is driven in part by the, the work being done uh, at various labs at St. Jude, but also nationally, and the work led by Mary at St. Jude as part of the PGRN, is trying to identify additional inherited genome variations that we can translate to the clinic. And we think there are some that are uh, of great utility, I won't call them actionable, uh, of great utility. Uh, and so here's how we're trying to go about doing this. So once we identify a pharmacogenetic 
genotype that we think is clearly validated and of potential clinical utility, it goes on the problem list for the patient. So this is a screenshot from a problem list of our EMR, and it basically lists, as you can see there, TPMT deficiency uh, as a problem in this particular patient. And then there is this behind the scenes decision support that now knows about that and will um, alert the physician uh, should they begin to write orders on medications uh, that could be affected by these genotypes. And another screenshot, uh, what we want to do for all of our new ALLs, for example, they're all going on protocols, and most of the therapy given at St. Jude is on protocols, which is advantageous for what I'm talking about. But once they go on an ALL study, then it goes into the medical record to fire an alert that says you should go ahead and get a TPMT genotype on this patient because in a few weeks they're going to be getting a thiopurine and that would be useful. And you can, oops, even see at the bottom, it's pretty easy to just check the box and order the lab test to get a TPMT uh, genotype on that patient. Um, there's also a notice sent to the pharmacist and, and we have this multidisciplinary uh, care at St. Jude uh, that's been very, you know, extensively integrated that way for 50 years almost, uh, that says, you know, a TPMT genotype doesn't appear to exist uh, for this particular patient. You should know that they're now <clears throat> sort of in the queue headed toward therapy with the thiopurine, and you might want to talk about this on rounds to see if indeed you want to, uh, to get this, or if, if in fact there's been an order issued, then this would alert the pharmacist to, to potentially intervene if they've somehow missed the alert that's come up in the medical record. Now, if a physician sits down, a clinician sits down in front of the EMR and begins to order this medication, then this warning would come up and says this patient has an active uh, entry on the problem list of TPMT deficiency, says this might be important. You can see at the bottom they have some choices. They can cancel the order they've entered and enter something different. They can alter the dose according to a consult that would have been provided if they requested uh, or triggered electronically, uh, and they can modify um, their medication, their prescription accordingly. So this sort of happens in real time. Now, if they ordered this med and the patient were wild type, they wouldn't get any <clears throat> alert whatsoever because we're trying to avoid alert fatigue here. So it's only when we think it's something they need to perhaps take action on <clears throat> that it's in the record. And then um, there is a, um, a consult that's generated uh, through this process. This is all very standardized. The language has been sort of agreed upon uh, in an effort led by Mary and others at St. Jude in terms of what the content of those consults that go into the medical record look like in terms of the recommendations that are being made. <clears throat> now, the question is sort of how and when do we take one of these tests from the research side of the organization into the clinic? And this is actually from Mary's PGRN, Power for Kids, grant, um, Rochelle's here, um, a plug for PGRN. But, you know, part of the, the RFP said we want there to be a translation piece to this science. We don't want you to just be thinking about discovery. And so this basically sort of points out how we go about uh, trying to first discover and then and replicate and then prioritize and subsequently validate through various strategies before ultimately uh, taking one of these uh, into the clinic in terms of a clinical integration step. And there's no one formula that any of us use or that I would advocate, and in fact it might be different for different medications and different um, genetic traits. But there is a defined process that sort of is an extension of, of the clinical research that's done here. And I think on the clinical integration side, uh, you know, we look at discoveries made anywhere in terms of them being valid and perhaps in diseases other than we are treating, but if we think they're relevant to using these meds in our patients, uh, then we would formally consider the process of moving that into the, the electronic medical record, into the support. Now, I show Mary here as the CPIC queen. Um, I didn't get her permission for that, <clears throat> and I may pay for it later. But, uh, yeah, I will, Debbie says, okay. Uh, there, there, <laughs> there have been a number of published papers in the last year that represent this consensus view of whether a, a given genotype drug combination is ready for prime time, that is, ready for clinical translation. And these are going to continue to grow. There's one in press now. Um, 
and they're, they're being published in, in CP&T, but I think also importantly, they're being annotated on Farm GKB because this is gonna continue to be a moving target as additional data come to make the association stronger or less strong in terms of clinical utility. Um, but that certainly is one of the elements of information we use in, in making the, the translation. Now, I won't go through this in detail because many have already mentioned that we're all working against some gradient here in terms of trying to incorporate this into healthcare in this country because it's so fragmented. It's more sick care than it is prevention. Uh, the evidence, some think, is modest for many pharmacogenetic traits, and there is this genetic exceptionalism that these tests tend to have to overcome currently that other things in the clinic, whether it's proton beams or whatever, haven't had to overcome in the way of evidence. There's a lot of complexity, and that's going to continue to grow. There's a lack of, of standardized computational decision support in all of medicine, and we think there's a need for preemptive testing, particularly now, given you can do so many so cheaply in advance. Um, now, the advantage we have at St. Jude is many of these barriers actually aren't as operative at our place as there are a lot of other places. We pay for everything. We don't ask for any co-pays or deductibles. We provide all their health care, all their medications, inpatient, outpatient. Our EMR tracks their medication, their treatment for a lifetime, whether they were in our hospital or they were back in Southern California you know, on continuation therapy, we're still tracking what's happening and, and the meds are getting, the outcomes they're experiencing. Uh, our patient care and research, like so many cancer centers, is extensively interwoven. We've been doing the multidisciplinary thing for a long time. Uh, and we've got, you know, millions of dollars invested. We use Cerner, uh, but we've begun to individualize and customize our electronic medical record for providing this decision support. Now, the other thing, of course, that's happened is that we, are, we have now come to the point where we can do a lot of SNPs and a lot of genotypes on many drugs for relatively little money, and so it has become affordable for us to sort of do this, at least the DMET chip, uh, up front on everybody and have that information available when needed to take action. Um, and for the same money we were doing a couple of genes, maybe even one, a few years ago, we can now do all of these uh, and have that available for patients. Uh, and that certainly is making this preemptive approach to genotyping and use uh, feasible. So again, there's a process here, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but we are now doing the DMAT array up front under CLIA conditions. That's being done at, um, by Uli Brockel at the uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, but eventually, I think it'll be imported under our own labs. Um, we're using a very defined process to move this information from the research side to the clinical side, and I've told you about the decision support, and we've begun to test drive this on a couple of genes, tip, sip, uh, TPMT and CYP2D6. There is, anybody who knows Mary knows, there is a very well-defined process. It's in place, and I'm not going to walk you through this in detail or be in this slide. Um, I've alluded to some of the components of that in terms of data supporting the clinical implementation, but also this process of having 1,900 SNPs on 225 genes for every patient. How many of those go in the medical record? Maybe not all of those are currently actionable. So the question becomes, how do you do that? When do you move them? And so the way it's structured and, and the way we're doing it at St. Jude is the CLIA uh, DMAT array is being run, and we're getting all the data, so 1,900 SNPs, 225 genes, but it sits on the research side of the firewall. And then we, um, when we think the, the uh, evidence supports its translation across the firewall to the medical record, then we go through that process on the previous slide to make that decision and then ultimately migrate those one gene at a time and all their relevant SNPs going into the medical record and having the decision support uh, that I told you about. Um, why are we doing this under a protocol, which we are? It's currently... Every patient who has this done signs an informed consent on a protocol that has as its goal to migrate pharmacogenomics tests from the lab to the clinic. Uh, you could say, well, why, why isn't this just standard of care, order does a test and do it? And you know, there are a number of reasons uh, why we felt it was important to do it under a protocol. Even though the assay is being done as it should under CLIA, it's still a very complicated process in, in deciding which of those tests should go in the record. We are thereby not putting everything in the record. We are withholding some information from a patient. And we want them to know we're going to do that. And they have given us consent to do it. 
and uh, we felt we needed a consent for withholding some of the results and for dealing with the incidental findings in terms of other associations that have been linked, whether strong or not, with some of these genotypes, like 2D6 or, or whatever. So we're sort of up front and laying this out to the, to the patients. We would see this, we do see this as evolving to standard of care. And whether it takes us five years under this protocol to get there or 10, you know, remains to be seen. But the primary objective of this study is to estimate how many of our patients, given this diagnostic, are going to actually have high-risk genotypes, as we're calling them, which are actionable from a pharmacogenetic standpoint. And uh, we have a number of secondary objectives that are sort of enhancing the tools and, and the process for prioritizing uh, and assessing the uh, attitudes and concerns of the clinical staff. And, and using this. Now, any of you who would like to know more about this protocol can uh, get it through the internet website of St. Jude, shown here, and uh, there's a video that we make available for patients or parents to look at that are prospective enrollees on this trial. Um, and I know that Mary's shared this protocol in its entirety with some, of, uh, some other investigators, so you could contact her directly if you'd like to see the entire protocol. I would say that after having enrolled, I think, about 175 patients over the last several weeks or months on this trial, that about 15 percent, given just 2D6 and TPMT, about 15 percent have had what we refer to as high-risk genotypes that could be actionable. So I think that's, you know, that's about what we might have predicted, uh, but certainly supports the use of this. It's not just a rare uh, event for this to happen. Um, a few other things that are done as part of this, we uh, have an automated communication to the attending physician when a, con a consult and a, a, a genotype is done and a consult is rendered so that they get separate notification electronically, not just having to go to the medical record to see it, but they would get it on their desktop or mobile device. And also um, the parents can opt or patients can opt to receive a personal letter giving them the results of a genotype that we've now <clears throat> moved into the medical record. And all of them, essentially all of them, have asked for this. And so uh, we do provide that as well as this video. Here's an example of sort of one of these letters that will go out uh, to the parent saying, we did this genotype on your child, and, and here's what we found. And this is sort of a blow up of one element of that. But you know, sort of tell them where they fit in the grand scheme of things of a population of patients. Are they extensive metabolizers or one of these other more rare uh, genotypes for this particular polymorphism? And what does that mean in terms of our uh, decisions as clinicians? Uh, in the process of putting together this protocol and, and on, on an ongoing basis, um, we have a St. Jude Family Advisory Council, and they've been very engaged in sort of developing this trial. And you know, we asked them, do you want to know when we do this, and, and some say, you know, um, I don't even want, I don't even understand why you're telling me this, just do it. And, and others say, yeah, I'd like to know more about this. And, and so they, they have the option for, you know, this to go one way or the other. Uh, probably more patients and parents would say, I'm not sure why you're sitting down telling me all about this, just do it. It's another diagnostic test that you're telling me you need to do. And you don't tell me you do a lot of other diagnostic tests. Um, and so it runs the, the gamut. Now, sort of, where do we go from here in terms of scaling up? And we do have this big whole genome sequencing project and just sort of want to think beyond 1,900 SNPs and 225 genes to the future state, which is not that far into the future. And we have done almost 500 whole genomes in the last two years, uh, equal number of cancer genomes and corresponding germline DNA across the full spectrum of pediatric cancers. These are not currently being done as diagnostic efforts, they are discovery efforts. Um, but I would tell you that you know, our ability to generate whole genomes is, like yours, rapidly expanding. So we're now generating a whole, two whole genomes every day. Right? And we will probably be doing twice that next year. Right? So this is very feasible. I think all of us are seeing this, and particularly those working in cancer areas. Uh, and this is whole genome. This is not exome, transcriptome. Um, and if we sort of look at the landscape of, of genome variation that we're seeing, these are somatic changes across these diagnoses, you know, there's a lot of difference from uh, on the right, uh, some, the ones with high signals include osteosarcoma and some of the brain tumors, to infant leukemias having relatively few 
um, tier one mutations, which are missense mutations in coding regions, a lot of structural variants. Um, in a paper that's currently in press, will be out uh, fairly soon, just to illustrate, in looking at a, a subset of T lineage leukemia compared to the garden variety T lineage leukemia, so the early T progenitor T ALL, if we compare what we see in typical T lineage ALL, where we see NOTCH1, P10, and other well known uh, somatic changes in these genes, either mutations or focal deletions, uh, we can see quite a different spectrum in early T progenitor, where we're now seeing you know, drug targetable uh, mutations in genes like FLT3 or, or JAK kinases. And so I think. The future state is we're going to be wanting to do this on every patient to see whether they carry a FLT3 or a JAK2 or some other mutation that's driving their leukemia that could then drive a decision about treatment into the future. And, and then the challenge will be how do we move 20,000 genes and 3 million variants for each patient across this firewall as we're now doing for 1900 SNPs. I would submit that sort of what we're learning now with the pharmacogenomics as I've just discussed it, will inform how we do this on a much larger scale going forward, but that is exactly, you know, where we're headed, particularly in the, in the, uh, in the cancer world. So uh, sort of to wrap up my thoughts and comments, you know, where to from here, I do think over the next 10 years, obviously, it's going to become cheaper and cheaper to sequence a whole genome, and our ability to analyze it is getting cheaper and better as well, uh, but that sort of becomes a rate-limiting step. Um, there's going to be a continuous expansion, I would predict, in valid pharmacogenomic traits, so our, the pressure to do this is going to continue to increase. Um, these, are, these traits are going to, I think, become increasingly pharma, uh, polygenic in nature and going to invo involve rare variants and not just common variants that collectively have to be integrated into more sophisticated models to make decisions, treatment decisions, based on inherited or acquired uh, genome variation. And this is a figure that Eric Schett showed Friday when he was at St. Jude in terms of thinking about networks and the integration and communication across networks that are ultimately driving phenotypes, whether it's drug response or treatment risk or all of the above. Um, you know, I think our medical pharmacy and other health professionals are going to be better educated on this front, but I don't think it's ever going to be sufficient for them to do this without support. Um, because it's a moving target and it's, it's obviously very complex. Uh, and we're just going to have to keep improving our systems and uh, having experts be involved in this translation step. And that's who's in the room, so that's great. Um, and, and I do think it's going to continue to be a growing component of diagnoses and treatment decisions. That's certainly going to be true in our place and I, sus I suspect most of yours as well. So uh, as I have alluded to, there are lots of people involved. Mary's a PI of this study I've talked about, uh, this translation protocol, if you will, lots of players there. And of course, at, at St. Jude, pharmacogenetics, I guess now genomics, has been a team sport for a long time. And there are lots of people from our medical staff and PIs of trials to our pharmaceutical sciences group, our informatics group, our statistics folks, a lot of students and postdocs. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know if, if you want to take questions now or after the next speaker. Yeah, I, I think we actually have time for a couple of questions. And as the hands go up, I'll, I'll actually start. Um, <laughs> I, I, sort of the idea that um, you were able to make this an institutional strategic priority, uh, you're sort of a unique shop in that you're, you know, well known as a place that's a leader in terms of translating from research into clinical activity. Uh, are there any lessons that might apply to places that are sort of less in that kind of a leadership role in terms of going to your boards and getting that kind of buy-in? And maybe as a related piece to that, one of the things that strikes me is that cancer is sort of in a unique area in many of these cases. Nearly, even at our place, most cancer patients are on a protocol of one sort or another, whereas that's not true in a lot of other areas. How much does that benefit your institutional buy-in? I think it benefits that at St. Jude, it's, you know, almost all of our patients are on some protocol. Usually their primary treatment is driven by a protocol. When I say usually 75, 80 percent, the reality is in adult oncology, it's 5 percent. So I think there's, you know, 5 percent of patients are on protocols. The other 95 percent are out in best clinical management. So I think adult oncology is not the same world. What's that? Not necessarily best. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> yes. 
uh, what's considered most lucrative. most lucrative clinical medicine, <laughs> according to an expert in adult oncology, Dr. <laughs> from an academic perspective. Um, now, so going to the boards, you know, this is a tough one because I sit on another hospital board, the university, and I just can't get them to, they, the boards like the being leaders and being innovative and to say we offer personalized medicine or genomics medicine or whatever, but they're not really often willing to put the resources in it to make it happen, and if they can't get it reimbursed, then they start saying, well, let's wait until it's more, you know, let's wait till we're forced to do it, either by the other hospital in town doing it and we've got to, or by lawsuits or by some other um, force. So, you know, I, it's been very helpful that there's a research element of pharmacogenomics at St. Jude, and so it's not viewed as sort of arbitrary but being driven off of science, and, and our board's been very receptive to that approach, whether it's the way we treat cancer or the way we move genetic tests into the medical record. But, you know, I would say that uh, the translation piece is not funded by NIH. The discovery piece is. It's also funded to some extent by donations, because we can never get 100% on the dollar from our NIH grants, right? And so uh, Saturday, we were at the St. Jude Marathon, which raised $4 million. Yesterday, I was in the hospital touring Taylor Swift. So there's a lot of other efforts going on to bring the resources to bear to be able to do this. So I have um, a, a couple of questions. Uh, I'll ask some sequentially since they're not directly related. The first is you're in a unique position also because you are also the payer. Um, so you're really integrated on the cost side. So I'm curious if you've done formal return on investment analyses on uh, what this impact has had for your cost structure. Yeah, I haven't done it on this project per se, but we did it on how we treat ALL. And we compared what we spend at St. Jude to the cooperative group, which is the other 200 institutions in the U.S. And when we did this, we were spending $150,000 per year per average, and the group was spending 50. So I told the board, we are spending three times more dollars per patient. And, and I said, but if you look at the number of papers published per patient treated from St. Jude versus everybody else, we were publishing 20 times more papers. We were spending three times more dollars. So to me, it was a seven-fold favorable return on investment. <laughs> It all depends on the metric of success. It, well, uh, you know. it does. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm one of the few CEOs that can, I used to be could lose $350 million a year and keep his or her job. Right. Now that's well, pretty actually, common on, on, on Wall, Wall Street. Street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we were there early in that paradigm. In fact, you wouldn't qualify for your top bonus if you only lost $350 million a year. The um, other good thing about St. Jude, there's no compensation incentives based on the bottom line. Right. Yeah. It's all based on new knowledge. We, we do two things state-of-the-art treatment, and generate new knowledge. And so the return on that investment is more publications, more knowledge. So the second question then relates to that, and it, it is that, you know, it seems from your presentation that you give providers the opportunity to choose, um, you know, am I going to follow this instruction or not follow this instruction? So the question is, are you, are you tracking those decisions and are you tracking the patient outcomes based on whether or not, uh, uh, say a TPMT um, uh, protocol is followed versus not followed. Yeah, we definitely track that. Now, the good news for us is all the medical staff work for us. So there's no one coming in out of private practice and opting not to do this. Um, we definitely give our physicians a choice. I'm glad that came through. But if they don't make the right choice, <laughs> we give them a lot of coaching. How's that sound? They're terrified when Mary shows up in their office. Yes. We have published data on lowering toxicity of thiopurines. It's been replicated around the world, so that's pretty solid. Uh, we have, you know, other data on the 2D6 and codeine lack of response. It's coming from other institutions. But we share that with them and say, this body of evidence has convinced us that patients will have better outcomes. Now, ultimately, you know, we're not going to have those that did and those that didn't get pharmacogenomics at St. Jude. Pardon? Yeah, I mean, it's just not a comparison we're going to make internally because we're going to make sure all the kids get the benefit of what we decide is clinically 
useful in the way of a genetics test. But when we look at our outcomes versus the rest of the world, and they're better, we won't know for sure how much that contributed to it. Uh, but it I might think be we part need to it. move along, but Eric okay. had one quick question. Yes, one quick question. Your statistic about your sequencing two whole genomes a day. Yeah. That's you guys or that's your partnership with Washington University Center? It's two together. WashU is where we have most of the high seeks. We've got a few at St. Jude. So we're doing all the validation work. They're doing all the high throughput sequencing of whole genomes and sending us the data that we're both doing but it's the, the analysis. Joint effort that's it's a completely joint yeah, effort. Okay. Paid for by St. Jude, but uh, yeah. Uh, all right. We would, we would love for NIH to help if you want. <laughs> Th thank you very much, Bill. That was great.